have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hi there. Welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and along with me... <laughs> I'm good. I didn't see that. What? 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 Eh? Eh? Let me introduce you to you to my awesome film officiados and our special guests, which uh, we'll talk about later. Uh, first up, we got Matt Bernays, known as Animat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't finish uh, doing research for this episode. I'm in the middle of the process. Uh, <laughs> the cow jumped over. Good. I'm ready. All right. Good. 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 Next up, we got the master of obscure media, Morgan Ledger. I'd like to confirm in last week's episode that um, when I meant giving a two weeks notice, it means giving a two weeks notice so I could work at the woods for an entire month. So, if you don't see me for the next two episodes, that's because I am scaring the shit out of people. Yep. Yeah. Though I, am, though I am thinking of doing pre-recordings just for the halibut and seeing where it goes. And hey, well, it's a good chance to mess with these guys' minds. We will experiment that. I already have a few ideas. <laughs> Should be interesting, uh, keeping posted. And uh, next up is Jane Sullivan, also known as Hymitude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by the special new Patreon entry, Win a Date with Cinema Royale. Oh. With more than with more than three hundred dollars and en in enough in enough money uh, to cover the to cover the plane ticket. If you put that into our our Patreon account right now, you can win a date with any one of us. We will be uh, anyone you see here: Morgan, Matt, Mike, or even myself. Chip an extra fifty to get homeless Bobcat. <laughs> Want to want to ask me out for dinner? Ask me about my hair. Ask me about Matt's hair. Yeah, that sort of thing. Ask me about Morgan's lack of hair. <laughs> ask me about Mike's balding spot. Yes, you notice I'm balding. Yes, wait, yes, I'm. Wait. Ladies, ladies, keep in mind, I'm perfect for date night. Oh no, I'm perfect for movie night. No, I'm perfect for both actually. And I'm perfect for a six cents of humor. It's it's bigger than his DVD collection. I I give good lip on first date. Ooh. And I'm good at sex. <laughs> <laughs> that was gonna be my other sponsor, but thank you for bringing that up. Uh <laughs> Boy, this is a great upstart so far. And uh, our guest tonight is uh, the man who created the site known as That Fell in the Coat, uh, Stefan Ellison, also known as Mr. Coat. I'm the man behind the curtain. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, you are. The man behind are the you, scenes. Are you, are you related to Frank Osnowitzki? <laughs> anyway. Anyways, tonight we're going to uh, talk about uh, book to film annotations. We have five exclusive films that are based on books, and we're going to talk about how they are faithful to the book, whether they are or not. Uh, some are quite interesting choices. Uh, Stefan Ellison here does not know what our choices are, so it's going to be a surprise for him as we talk about them. No spoilers. I'm just kidding. Uh... Since he's our guest, let's let him start off with his choice, known as MASH. Yes, this is a book I read recently, first time, uh, which was adapted into one of my all-time favorite comedies, which was then adapted into one of my all-time favorite TV series. But the, uh, the book, which is fully titled MASH, a novel about three army doctors, was, Richard, was uh, written by... Dr. Richard Hornberger, or as he's known by his pen name, Richard Hooker. And it was inspired by his time as a surgeon in a MASH unit during the Korean War. MASH standing for the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And it's about a lot of their 
escapades they try to fight off you know the boredom mm-hmm yeah that I I remember seeing that film I never I never read the book but it 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 seemed it, it seemed like um it, it seemed very episodic uh, yeah, well, especially I guess... for an early off in film but go on yeah, well, I guess it makes sense. They later made a TV series out of it. Um, mm -hmm. So the TV mm -hmm. series did more, you know, was, took elements from the book in the beginning of the run, but then later it kind of became more its own thing. And what was interesting, because I, I listened to uh, Robert Altman's commentary on the movie, and he actually hated the book. He thought it was sexist and racist and just not a fan of it. And what convinced him to do the movie was he liked Ring Lerner Jr.'s screenplay so much. Although he wasn't Fox's first choice to do it, because they, they went through a list of named directors and they all turned it down. And at the time, Altman, he done a couple movies, mostly industrial films, and he mostly directed on television. So it wasn't a named director. This movie made him a named director, though when he passed away, it was still easily as biggest commercial hit um and well but the funny thing is you know despite him liking the script so much he actually gave the actors free reign to improvise which annoyed Lorner a lot although you know when the movie won the oscar for adapted screenplay he happily accepted the award <laughs> but yes you know, it was all my idea <laughs> But what's funny is it, it's relatively faithful to the book, the movie, in many ways. You know, characters are about the same. He kind of, because in the book, uh, the Hawkeye character, he has no problem, you know, throwing um, racial slurs around. And in the movie, he doesn't. And in the TV series, the, I'm, the Hawkeye from the TV series would not get along from the Hawkeye from the book because they're completely different characters and Richard Hooker hated the TV series because he thought it just didn't do his book justice but the movie, the movie you know the book itself is pretty episodic because it is about you know them different going days on in one, the life of uh, yeah, these guys yeah one adventure to another and but what's but it is a fairly entertaining book despite it, it, it's a okay, couple problems like you know like the racial slurs and stuff like they they really throw that around but i think part of the appeal is it's um uncensored quality like they don't clean up like he doesn't clean up the characters and the movie did the same right robert altman really sought to make it the movie as grimy as possible while still making it you know very funny and it, altman even though it's set during the korean war fully intended to be a commentary on the Vietnam War. And the own and the few references to the Korean War in the movie are two quotes that appear like in the beginning, which he was forced at by the studio. Mm -hmm. But it's the uh, the funny thing is like one element that's criticized in the movie is final twenty minutes as a football game. That happens between the mass unit and the evac unit. Which I remember that. A lot of people feel it's really nothing to do with anything, which is true, but that, that was in the book. Right? <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then, so, yeah, it was pretty faithful. And they, you know, they took characters and, and combined them. Like the, uh, in the movie, there's the major Frank Burns character who's sort of main antagonist for Hawkeye Pierce and Trapper John and but in the book he's, he's two separate characters and they just combine them and then the TV show used the, the combined character oh so that's so the TV show is more based off of the film than based off of the book yeah although the, um, the pilot mm -hmm. the, the main plot the pilot which is Hawkeye trying to raise money to send a Korean boy to an American University is taken from a part of the book that wasn't used in the movie. But otherwise, they... they um, but then as, as the show went on, it kind of became its own thing, and 
and you know as is well known it became a balanced more drama and comedy while the beginning it was more of a traditional sitcom mm. you know yeah. uh, uh, I just want to say sorry James um, I just want to say this about MASH um, you know I really do regret not knowing that you Stefan would talk about MASH because if I knew about it beforehand then I would have made myself like prepared a little bit like I would have prepared myself a little bit more and I would talk to the one person I know who was who was a major major MASH fan my mom she was a huge fan of MASH she loved watching the TV shows and I remember like there were like I would watch like I would go to a channel and like there was a show I watched I don't remember but like beforehand it would show MASH to show MASH and she would remember like just like little clips at the end of the TV show, like what epi- what the episode was about. So like, I, I don't think she ever read the book, but uh, for sure she saw the movies and like she loves the TV shows. But yeah, I definitely, uh, the, like the crazy thing with MASH, like I didn't know it was based on a book, but uh, the impact that it had on both television and the movie itself, it was pretty, like it really is big. So I, I, I recall it's like one of the biggest movies like of the 70s so it definitely like it definitely really did uh make a major impact but the the fact that like it started out as a book but then it turned into something like a little bit different um that's you know it's pretty surprising man like it really does like show the impact that it really had in like all different sorts of mediums not just book books but also movies and tv Mm mm-hmm and the funny thing is i mean fox didn't you know because it was a pretty low budget movie so they didn't think it would be anything you know maybe you know make a small pop but they didn't expect it to be so big because they had two other war movies they were doing that year with Patton and Tor Tor Tora and so that you know more prestigious films so they didn't, they actually didn't play it didn't pay too much attention to the production of MASH so then it came out with a huge hit because it spoke to people at the time because you know, Vietnam wasn't a very popular war, and I think people really gravitate towards it. And the the funny thing is, the TV show when it the first season wasn't a big ratings hit. Like it struggled the ratings, and it was only later that it started slowly finding an audience, and then it became a big thing and ran for eleven seasons. Mm-hmm. It's kind of amazing. Cheers. Oh yeah, and uh, and friends. Yeah, I, I'm even looking at again this magazine. I found all these parodies, and they even do one on Mash as well, <laughs> just mishmash. mishmash. Mm-hmm. And the, they're parodying a scene. I, I feel terrible because I didn't see the movie, but I did see episodes of the show. Of course, mm-hmm. we can't forget the spam lamb. Um, but there's one where they're parodying one of the disgusting uh, operating scenes. <laughs> Um, and just to quickly point out here, we have a special guest in the corner witnessing it. Hey, Bill, go see. And he says, I made the wrong movies. Well, I mean, one thing I really like about the book was that when there are the certain scenes and they're talking, they, you know, they have all the medical terminology, but it's still written in a way that you understand what they're talking about. And the movie did the same thing. And the movie, you know, especially for its time, because it was you know, made made in 1969, then released in 1970, was pretty gruesome. You know, the but he wanted it to feel real, and they. It's impressive that CBS allowed then the makers of the TV show to to show. You know, you see their bloody gloves on the show, mm. and they. And um, I mean, I think one of the nice aspects to the TV show because it was a sitcom and you know now it's not I, I, I think MASH even led the way to um, laugh track less sitcoms because mm. they, they made a deal with CBS that they would use a laugh track but not for the surgery scenes and then as the show went on they used the laugh track less and less and the DVDs actually give you the option of switching the laugh track off oh nice yeah yeah, I remember one thing. I remember one big thing about the this film in particular. Um, I think 
I think one of the the things that that really pushed it uh, was uh, or product, production wise, mind you, was uh, the sound mixing. In Robert Altman films, one of the one of the uh, trademarks that he seems to like to or that he seemed to like to to repeat is they there was always this emphasis on sound and atmosphere there's not a if you sit back and listen to an Altman production it's um there's there's like a lot of a lot of ambience there's there's a lot of sound in there to try and put you into any given environment and I think that was partly what it, one of the things that I read up was um, that was a that was um, during a time when the Dolby surround system or one particular iteration of it was new, and he was one of the big experimenters of it, and, or something uh, of that nature. Yeah, one of Altman's trademarks is overlapping dialogue, which mm -hmm. says a lot of in the movie because you have, you know, when they're in the surgical room or when they're, you know, eating in particular. I mean, there's the character in the novel called um, Radar Riley, who's inspired by a real person who had this ability to know when helicopters were coming. And then the book added him knowing what the other one would say. And that's used really well in the movie. Mm -hmm. And especially in the TV series, they really expanded that aspect of the character hmm interesting so I have a question though uh, regarding uh, something you said earlier about Altman's uh, pure, uh, opinion towards the book uh, he, so he thought that uh, the book was terribly sexist but um, somehow Hot Lips Houlihan was uh uh, was appropriate for the screen. Well, yeah. Well, I think he also he wanted to, like, I guess his interpretation of the book was that it was supportive of the treatment. While in the movie, he wanted to really show how women were treated during the war. And I mean, the weird thing is, like, in the same commentary, he talks about the TV show, and he also he also thought the TV show was racist and sexist. Mm. Um, which is weird because the, the TV show made a point of being, you know, particularly in its fiction of Sorry. the uh, Koreans of being very even handed. Right. And uh, the Hawkeye and the, the TV series, like I said, he wouldn't get along with the Hawkeye for the book, you know, hated the use of racial slurs. And one of the most interesting things I noticed reading the book, have, being so familiar with the TV series, was that the Hawkeye in the book pretty happily branches a gun all over the place, right? And shoots it, while the Hawkeye in the TV series hated using guns. So that really jumped out to me as a big difference. But I think that was also part, because they also let the actors, um, you know, evolve the characters a little bit. So Alan Alda, who played Hawk in the TV show, put a lot of himself in the role, particularly later on in the series when he became more involved creatively. Hmm. Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> Sorry, I was just uh, do some last minute research. Uh, who do you want to hear next? Uh, uh, popcorn. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> I'll pick um, James. All right, oh. J James, he has got one of the oldest books we're going to talk about on this podcast. Uh, yes, I'll give you a little clue. This book was published in 1865, and uh, and written by a man whose original name is Charles Ludwig Dodds Dodgson. Is it uh, Alice in Wonderland? Yes. 
Ding, 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 ding. But it's... And the man gets it? a cigar. But... <laughs> so, so here's... Explain, James. What do you have to say about this book? Well, here's the thing. I, I, I read it. I read it ages ago, when I was a kid and whatnot. And mainly, what I wanted to talk about here was not a particular adaptation, but adaptations, plural. Uh, this seems to be a particularly hard story to adapt, and. I, I think that's for at least, at least that's on on my uh, end of things. Uh, my, uh, my opinion of it, and I think that's partly because, uh, as I, kind of like with Mash, the story does have a very episodic feel to it. When there's, um, or I should even say, less than episodic. There's, there's no frickin' rhyme or reason to anything that goes on here. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, at the same time, um, there, there always seems to be trying, uh, whatever, or whoever screenwrites it into an adaptation is always trying to make some sort of arc into it. And sometimes, sometimes that works in creating something interesting, sometimes Sometimes it's kind of a mess, but they always they always uh, keep a lot of the same elements in place, and that was that uh, that's kind of what I what I wanted to bring up here is uh, is just how is just how bonkers this this story really is. I I remember watching the Disney version of Alice in Wonderland when I was a kid, that being the animated film version, and even though that's actually pretty faithful uh, to both books in the series, Alice Through the Looking Glass as well, um, it... I, uh... I, I enjoyed it more as a kid because I thought it was very colorful. I'm not so sure I liked it quite as much as an adult. Because I, I, I guess I don't... I guess I don't get it so much anymore. I don't know. What do you guys think? Really? Because... He, okay, I just... Um, let, let me put my info... Wait, did you mention, like, you don't like it much as an adult? What, which one are you talking about? The Disney version? The... Disney version, I I don't like as much as an adult. Like, oh wait wait, uh, wait 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 wait. Are you talking about the animated one or the Tim Burton version? Animated. Animated one. We okay. will okay. talk about the Burton version. Don't worry. Okay. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, is that I learned myself. I learn about myself more and more that apparently, like, I love Alice in Wonderland, and like, uh, I've mentioned it beforehand that when I was a kid, one of my favorite movies as a child was the 1951 Walt Disney version of Alice in Wonderland. But when I was, I remember when I was doing my research for uh, what was it, the 1949 stop motion animated feature of Alice, I was surprised to know that, like the whole thing about Alice in Wonderland, it's actually a parody, because um, what Charles had to go through is pretty much like everything he experienced in Oxford. Like each character from the Cheshire Cat, the Queen of Hearts, and all those characters, they were based on a high rank, like someone who was high ranked in England or in Oxford University and I find that really interesting and like it like at least it gives you an idea where he got his inspiration for the stuff like that but for me to clarify Alice in Wonderland what story are you talking about there is no story the most you'll ever get from a story is um like Alice is in Wonderland and like she sees things and she wants to get out there's barely a story because the whole point of Alice in Wonderland is all the characters, is the weird and creative characters. Alice in Wonder, the Walt Disney version of Alice in Wonderland is highly regarded as one of the best adaptations because it actually plays with one of Disney's biggest strengths, and that is bringing out memorable characters. Rather it be with uh, the Queen of Heart, uh, the Queen of Hearts, uh, the Mad Hatter, and March Hare. Tweedledee and Tweedledum, the walrus and the carpenter, and all those characters, like, they know how to really bring them to life in a way that is, um, like, very colorful, very animated, 
and just, you know, let the characters just be weird and be themselves. And it also helps with the act, like the actors are also a major contribution to this. Like uh, Ed Wynn and uh, uh, Jerry Corona, yeah, and J Ed Wynn and Jerry Corona, like that entire scene that you saw with uh, like in the tea party, that was all improvised. Nothing that in there. Was? Like, yeah, it was completely improvised, but they tried but to it... do it a second time, but it didn't really work out as much. So they pretty much took all the recordings that they did when they were just goofing off. Hmm. What like, about? But don't what? they? Don't they have? I'm sorry for cutting you off there. Oh, that's okay. uh, don't don't they have? Uh, uh, don't they have lines from the book there? Maybe, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I know yeah. when they recorded the voices, they actually had them on a stage, like in costume, mm -hmm. as like, also as reference to the animators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the animation. that was the bigger point. Like in, hmm. like they even had um, Catherine Beaumont, like she would often be there as Alice and stuff like that. So it wouldn't make sense to just take the recordings from there and just use it. On the bright side, Disney got something really good out of that movie. Mm -hmm. A giant train said he could ride around the studio. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. For, for, oh, yeah, for, that's... For, for all of you non-Disney fans, um, when he was working on the film, he did like a little Christmas special, and it was revealed that he got a train set, and you can see a promotional feature. I think it's like 15 or 18 minutes called Operation Wonderland. I think it's called Operation Wonderland, where you see him and some other guy riding around on this giant train set, just seeing all the studio sets and everything, and he had a ball with that one. Yep. It's, uh, uh I believe, yeah, it is uh, Operation Wonderland. Yes. You can get it in this. Mm -hmm. Or the Masterpiece Edition. Yeah. Well, I mean, the ver I, I grew up with the animated uh, Disney version. And the uh, <laughs> Care Bears one. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Back to Wonderland. I haven't revisited that. I haven't watched that movie since I was like eight. But I did watch it a plenty uh, before then. Um... And the Tim, well, the Tim Burton one, I think it's, I like the Tim Burton one, but I, I reckon I, I wish that movie was a, was actually more nonsensical, which is weird for Tim Burton. Like, I, I, I think Tim Burton should have gone full on just Batman Returns nuts on that. <laughs> I think I he think did, that, and maybe that was sort of the problem. But No, uh, the, uh, the biggest issue is that it really fooled a lot of people, because... With a title like Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, you think it would be the ultimate match made in heaven. You think this would be the perfect adaptation of Ad Alice in Wonderland. But the problem is that it's not an adaptation. It's like this weird sequel-ish about like this revolution and stuff like that. Yeah, it actually, when I saw the movie, it reminded me more of Return to Oz. Mm -hmm. In terms of the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, at yeah. least Return to Oz, it, did, it gives you an indicator that it's a sequel. Yeah. Yeah, I would have called it Return to Wonderland, or something like that. <laughs> or Return and... to Underland. Uh, yes. Underland. Underland. Well, Underland. now, because they have a sequel coming out next year called Alice Through the Looking Glass, which only s confuses things even more. Because mm -hmm. isn't, like, I only read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but isn't the Jabberwocky, a major character in The Looking nope. Glass. Nope. But they nope. killed him no. off at the end of the... No, 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 no. This is going to be, like, an entirely different movie because, like, this is going to be a sequel to it. And I think the new villain is going to be Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah, he's a character called Time. Time. Yeah. And, and oh, besides, wow. Alice, Alice in the Looking Glass is more of a chess game. And it's weird because the climax of the final movie is on a giant chess board, but it doesn't feel like chess is going on. So maybe here they're going to fully utilize the whole idea of chess, because after all, use time in chess. In, in chess. So maybe they're going to do something with that. Um, and by the way, Matt, shut up. It's directed by James Bobbin, not Tim Burton. Okay. I remember that post. I is remember it? that. I, I Yes. Yes. And he directed the Muppet movies, by the way. And I read an interview with James Bowman. Like, apparently, he's a big Lewis Carroll fan. You know, while wait, you, yeah, the, wait. the guy directed Mupp the Muppets and Muppets Most Wanted. Oh, the, oh, for the sequel, you mean? Yeah, Through the Looking Glass. Okay, 
No, I never, I never indicated that the sequel was will be directed by Tim Burton. <sighs> there oh, was he's... a there there was a post where you just had the poster, and underneath it was Alice saying, "Oh no." No, I. Uh, well, all I remember was just the Salvador Dali clocks and just Alice in weird clothing. You know the the 2010 film. I, I consider it a guilty pleasure because I, I was I was dreading it like everybody else, and then when I sat back and watched it, and I kind of I I like epic adventure stories, and that's that's kind of what this is. Even though, even though that's not what the story's meant to be, it's just sort of taking the same characters and saying, "Let's make Narnia out of it." Yeah, like, I, I don't think it's a perfect film either. There are some spots that do irk me a little, but there are some spots where I do think they sort of work for what it is, even dark humor, which I'm surprised to get away with at the same time. It's like, okay, I can kind of see this working in a sense. There's a scene where I think the Red Queen's leaning down on the moat, and they, you see, like, from a distance, the head of the king, and the queen is all like, he didn't... He, he, I, I didn't want him to go or leave or something like that. So it's like, okay, the joke's actually kind of funny. He killed him because he was going to leave her or something to that extent. Yeah. yeah like the, should have been at least sorry. rated PG-13, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for me, like, I, I'm rather mixed with it. It's just, like, it did do some things right, but, like, overall, it's just, like, blah. Like, I do, like, it looks great. The visual effects are awesome. Um, I love Helena Bonham Carter's performance, and I also like Stephen Fry's performance, but other than that, like, some of the decisions are either bad or just plain weird. Like, I don't really get, like, Anne Hathaway walking around like a fairy godmother. I don't know if I'm the only one, like, I, I always, I always see freaking Johnny Depp as a haunted mansion ghost walking around as a Mad Hatter. Um, I'm the box ghost. <laughs> yeah. No, the hat box ghost. Yeah. Oh, from just day. Yeah, hello, I hello. That, I, that, like, I already made that, that comparison. It's like it's the same thing, but um, no. But other than that, it's just it's just overall weird, but not in the way that it should be. For for me, the book is interesting because it's an entire universe you're going into, and you have no idea what is up or what is down, and you're sort of going into this alternate reality, and that's what I liked about it as a kid when I first saw the movie, and this is actually 100% true. It freaked me out. Like, I couldn't even get through, like, the half of it. I remember my mother just shutting off the tape, and I was, like, crying or uh, at one point, so I just couldn't get, you know, throughout the whole film. I was just freaking out and just scared or something. Um, but this I do is the remember... Disney version? Yes. No, I... Oh, I was that... younger. I was younger. I was Why about to say... To... You know, Morgan, I was about to say, well, that's what happens when you watch the, Jan, uh, the Jans Funkmeyer version. <laughs> Those poor, poor oysters. Um, so, yeah, the, the versions I tend to look at, you know, the anime movie I did see later when I was an adult, or at least when I was, like, elementary school and stuff, not elementary school, like, yeah, maybe, like, near around fourth or fifth grade. And I, I do think it's a decent adaptation that goes close to the source, aside from some deviations which are acceptable. Ding. Done that opinion. The one I'm surprised that no one really talks about that much is the Hallmark Entertainment version with, like, Whoopi Goldberg as the Cheshire Cat and Martin Short oh, yeah. as the Mad Hatter. I think that is not a bad one, either. I think that's really good. That's one that sticks close to the source, and despite the low budget, they do as much as they can with that. Oh, yeah. And then there's I some... They, I like that. Mm -hmm. That is... And it's about as faithful as it can get. Miranda Richardson... Uh, Mike... Mar Miranda Richardson really good as the Red Queen. You got Gene Wilder as the Mock Turtle, which is really nice. Christopher Lloyd as the White Knight. It, it, there's a little bit of Through the Looking Glass in there, a little Tweedledum and Tweedledee scene. You have special effects by the Jim Henson Creature Shop. It's Always around, a plus. Always a plus. It's, a, it's, again, it's very close to the sources you can get to, and for what it is, it's good. I'm tempted to say it's a little better than the 80s version with Ringo Starr and all that, but mm -hmm. I've only seen bits and pieces of that one, but I did see its sequel, The Looking Glass, which is tolerable aside from its being a musical extravaganza. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents on that one. Tim Burton movie, it's okay. It's got problems. I really don't need to say my thoughts. I think you guys pretty much just summed it up. Yeah. I, I just remembered... 
that mm -hmm. I another version I've seen, which I personally Hopefully. couldn't stand, was in the, was in the late '80s stop motion film. I think it was from the Czech Republic. Mm, yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, that yes. one. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it, is that the one with like the little mutated sock people and the yes. rabbit cutting yes. heads yes. off? Yes, yes. I, I, that, that was just messed got up. That is messed up. That is. That movie oh just got God. on my nerve, especially that weird device where they just randomly cut to Alice saying the white rabbit said. It's like yes. after the fifth yes. time, I was like, "Will you stop that? <laughs> <laughs> Will you stop that?" Snake <laughs> Major. That is weird and freaky as all hell, and like. It's, it's like, this is one of those things where stop motion was used more as kind of a horror element. Because, like, you see a lot treat, of the things, treat. like, especially, like, the baby frog or, like, no, the white rabbit. That freaking, the white rabbit, my God, that is the scariest white rabbit I've ever seen. And, like, just everything, like, this is one of those things that it's weird but in a bad way. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen this film. I, I was surprised actually to see, uh, just to, to, to hear you say right there, uh, Jan Spankmeiser. That's he's he's like a a treasure of the Czech Republic, and he did he did this uh, he did this version of it. If you haven't seen this guy's work, he's great at doing stop motion surrealist comedy. Oh my goodness, I'm watching a clip from what. From what you guys are talking about right now, <laughs> yeah, like um, uh, if, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, I highly recommend uh, I highly recommend checking out the Browse Held High episode of Alice. They actually, he actually, um, Cal Calgren really went into detail about like, oh my this. god, it's a get a rabbit, it's not ordinary rabbit, here's a streak a mile long. Okay, no, that's but, not like, as disturbing, disturbing looking as it could have been, but okay. No, but one thing I will I will mention is that it's actually kind of freaky how. Like, a lot of people adore it, apparently. And uh, I'm checking out Time Out's 100 Best Animated Films. And they ranked it up, like, seriously high at, like, number 12. That yeah. I'm honestly shocked to see. Interesting. Yeah, like I said, though, he's good at surrealist comedy and even, as, as you sort of pointed out there, surrealist horror. And that those are two of his greater strengths. But um, whether okay. or not... Whether or not this actually works as a film, uh, I have yet to, to find out myself. Although, keep in mind, this is actually, uh, it actually mentions that this is uh, Jan Spunkmeyer's first movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His first feature-length film, yeah. He was, he, was, he was really good at doing short subjects. If you, uh, there's one called uh, Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner, I think. If, you, it, if anyone listening has the time, watch that one. It's it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and then there's the 2009 miniseries, Alice. I don't know how many people here remember this one, but it was it was a, a sci-fi channel version, I think, with um, It was Kathy. a steampunk, a post-apocalyptic kind of thing, and the White Rabbit was a robot or something. That's all yeah. Yeah, if you if you thought Tim Burton's take on it was strange, <laughs> this is here. Here's at least that was memorable to a to an extent. This one, um, I let's see. The Red Queen is the Red Queen in this version. She's running a. Uh, she's she's running. Um. A, a casino and it's draining the energy out of people and sucking them sucking their energy into the floor and whatnot reimagining mm -hmm. and that's that's where we have uh, that, that's where we have another element where um, like with the Tim Burton film they're waging war against the the Red Queen and rebelling and and this in this version, we have uh, you actually have the Mad Hatter being a love interest with Alice, who's much older, and twenties, uh, thirty something, I guess, uh, living in New York, New York City. And that's that's where this one gets 
a little bit interesting, but at the same time strange, because you have... Because Wonderland here looks like... Uh, it it looks like a, a steampunk um, New York City. It's in the future. Or it's in the past, or it's somewhere in between. This, Welcome yeah. to the world of tomorrow! <laughs> Sorry. The, or yesterday, today! The one thing... The one thing, though, that really works here... Uh, at least according to me, was uh, Matt Frewer playing the White Knight. Uh, you don't see this guy... You don't see this guy enough. I don't think. He... Um, but every but every time you do see him, whatever role he's playing, it uh, he's, he's one of those actors who just has a delight in doing it. And here... Here he's, he's putting on... A very traditional white knight character, you know, uh, a guy, a guy who's, um, you know, in in over his head with his own self glory. But in the in the end, uh, he actually kind of realizes, you know what? He comes clean and says, you know what? I'm I'm not really the real white knight. I just sort of um, I fought with him, but um, I ended up. Uh, uh, I, I ended up putting on his clothes, you know. But but he he's having a lot of fun with the character and that's that's where you you can't really take your eyes off of him. Oh, um, I found Matt I found Matt Fewer. Mm -hmm. He was in pixels as Max Hedrum. I was just that yeah. Was, that was like a brief like twenty second cameo. Though I am looking at the his... um the the aliens also like inhabit like eighties pop culture icons like Madonna and and uh, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> okay, I was just also about to say he's in two movies that are coming out next year, one of them being a Yui Bull movie and the other being a mystery thriller, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Mm. Oh, they also got Billy Zane in the mystery thriller, it's called House in the Hamptons. Look out for it in two thousand sixteen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Any other Alice interpretations? The the eighty five uh, version. Do we go? Um, do we count also like some other mediums? Like, can we count the uh, video game Al Alice? Uh, American the, McGee's the Alice, Alice video game with uh, American uh, uh, America McGee like cheese or something. Yeah, and where does the Animaniacs episode with Indian buttons fit in? <laughs> there's an Animaniacs episode? Yeah! There, there's a scene where Mindy goes into Wonderland because she's going after the bunny, and Buttons follows us, of course. He has to go and save her, and they run to all the cra crazy contraptions and everything, and the Mad Hatter tries to kill Mindy at one point by throwing all the dishes in, like, some weird dishwasher kind of machine, and, like, I, I, I think they have, like, Rita well, in the cameo. Well, who wouldn't? She asked, too... well, <laughs> asked way too many questions. <laughs> The best part, of course, is near the end when she comes across the Red Queen and, of course, names her Lady and she's going to be beheaded because she calls her Lady instead of the Queen. <laughs> oh. Hmm. I, I gotta Buttons, see you're that. Destroy Buttons, you destroyed my rose bush. <laughs> <laughs> it, always, it always bugged me as a kid. It's like, hey, he tried to save your kid and he's getting the bad rap. Come on, get security cameras or something. That's the only flaw I have with those... With, with, with that with that segment because it, it, it's such a there's only so many times you can have the dog getting dumped on it mm -hmm. really bugged me as a kid yeah he's and it well he got he got he got his just desserts in Wacko's Wish so still it, it's kind of Ooh. it's kind of imbalanced <laughs> <laughs> So there's another adaptation that I can kind of want to bring up that James might not have seen. There's a British film from 2009 called Malice in Wonderland. I may have heard something about this. It's, there's, yeah, uh, go on. It's basically a modern take on the famous uh, fairy tale by Carol. It's about a university student. Uh, she's played by Maggie Grace, who you may know as the daughter in Taken, mm -hmm. um, who is knocked out. 
Uh, he's she's knocked out over a black cab in London. When she wakes up, she's she has a amnesia lost in the world that is long away from home called the Wonderland. She's dragged through a crazy, twisted underworld filled with bizarre individuals and low lives. But the cab by the cab driver Whitey, uh, confused, she tries to find out who she is, where she's from, and what and use what wits she has left to get back home safe. I may have actually uh, seen the trailer for this. This is um, this is more like uh, like you say. This is a this is more of a a modern take. A, a trying to trying to be realistic take on the on yeah. the story. Yeah, a realistic uh, take. Uh, I rem. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh. It's not noteworthy. It's not really something you seek out to see it. I mean, it's uh, it's got like ten percent run on Rotten Tomatoes. So. Mm. Also, mm. there's one more Alice Brooks. I'm surprised that none of you have picked up. Other than the '85 version, which I grew up watching, and uh, just want to give my two cents. I'm not so sure that it ages very well, but maybe that's my nostalgia wearing off. Is um, it on the Jabber? The yes. Right. Yes, the one with the to be continued, and then I never saw the ending for another twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I'm, seen this in twenty years. Oh my god! The, the one I'm talking about is a film that ironically came out in 1985, and it's called Dream Child, and it revolves around the Alice that Lewis Carroll based the character off of and she's an old woman and she's going over from England to New York to celebrate the anniversary of the book and stuff and you see like these flashbacks uh, with her working with um, Charles Dotson and seeing the relationship between the two and the biggest highlight that you know, the reason why I hunted down this film is because there's once in a while these nightmarish dream sequences where she pictures actual scenes from the story with the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and the Caterpillar. And the biggest thing is that those creatures are done by... And who else? Um... <laughs> Thank you for spoiling that one. Um, done by Jim Henson's Creature Shop, and this was when they were slowly doing other projects for the films. And if you have no idea what they look like, well, um... Make sure you leave the lights on in bed tonight after seeing these images. Okay, let's go down and see this. On, uh, and I know I have a copy of it as well. Oh. Don't get. <laughs> uh, nightmare if you I think I've Jesus. seen. Oh my and god. If you're good enough, I'll show you a scene after. It's the tea party scene. It's really screwed up. Well, I can take. I could take uh, the devil, the storyteller, and all that crazy shit that he used to do back in the '80s. So I, I would, I probably eat this up, no matter how good it is. He, his crew is behind the effects work, not yeah. the entire film, but that's sort of just a basic idea of what the whole movie is like. It's uh, the Alice going back and forth thing was the person that I knew a good man or a bad man everyone's like oh yeah Alice Wonderland's a great book and she's like going I don't know about that it's kind of like it's sort of like New Nightmare but with Alice in Wonderland ah, it's the best way to describe it mm. but yeah again the biggest highlight is the scenes where they recreate certain images and stuff especially a scene with the Griffin and the Mock Turtle which bookend the movie cleverly so it is available on DVD but it's a mod so if you're that curious I recommend it but um, if you're gonna see it just for those nightmare scenes I talked about, they're very brief, but they're really interesting in the context of the film. So if you like historical fiction, it's it's worth a shot. Okay. I think we're ready to move on yes. to next. So James, who That's would you fish. like to hear next? I popcorn. Hmm. Morgan. Damn it! I was hoping to book on the thing, but all right. So, yeah, I was really, really um, hoping to do something Rondal, but unfortunately, that went to Matt. So, um, it was between. I didn't say the There's title. There's lots of options. So yeah, anyways, go on, Morgan. 
All right, originally I was going to do Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but of course we had another book mm -hmm. by that one, and Stefan was coming on, I didn't want to create World War IV. Um, <laughs> so it was... <laughs> it's a good adaptation. It's a good adaptation. Go on, yep, get to it. Go on. It's yep, a good get to adaptation. It. You have 40 minutes. So it was between doing a book that I didn't read, but a movie I've seen, or just doing something from memory, and so I went with Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes, which it's one of my all-time favorite dark fantasies, and I just love the hell out of it. Just the dark atmosphere, the characters, the, the simple premise, the setups, the twists and turns it takes, just the whole idea of something as simple as a carnival and turning into this very dark and twisted nightmarish dreamlike place is just really interesting to look at, just very intriguing, and not to mention it's really an achievement in the special effects and how they assist with the horror aspect of the film. You have these two kids that, you know, see this very supernatural fantasy kind of thing going into town that's kidnapping people, making devilish deals and stuff like that, like giving them youth or their pride back or certain things, all for their soul and stuff, making them part of the carnival. And it's really dark stuff, and what I like about it is how it doesn't go out in the open and say, oh, they're one of us, they're part of us, they're like part of the freak show. They do it in such a subtle and ambiguous aspect that we connect the pieces without them forcing it out in the open. A good example is a bartender who's dubbed the town hero and he has like only one arm that he lost and he used to play football. And we see him in the carnival at one point winning a game and he gets a taken into the mirror and we see like subtly his reflection gaining his arm back and he goes straight through and then later in the movie they do a really eerie callback where you see him as a little small kid I think toss the uh the yeah like it's like, just it, like this Jim's random father. kid in the middle and just throws him a football it's like it's that, that is so creepy and that's the thing about this movie it is scary in atmosphere and setups like that where you don't know what direction it's gonna go in go in and then just hits you with it. You have the villain, Mr. Dark, who wins the carnival and he has tattoos all over his body and stuff like that. And there's that bit where he has like the faces of Jim and his friend on his hand and he crushes them and blood drips out and it's like, holy mackerel, you don't expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. it, it's the fact that you really, on first watch, you don't expect these scares to happen. You're just waiting for the movie to have an impact on you, and when it has an impact on you, that first time you watch it, you really feel the film just sink into your skin. It knows exactly where to hit you, especially the library scene, which in context, if you read on paper, it's like, oh, that's just a creepy scene, he's just, you know, taunting the dad and tossing pages out of a book. No, he's aging him. He's really aging him because the dad has a fear of him, of himself getting old and the fact that he's not a help to his son. And when he's tearing those pages out, you feel like a, a, a part of his life is being torn out. Like all these years that this dad is living through is literally making weaker and weaker and weaker. And I'm gonna bring this up, spoiler alert, there's a scene where the dad is like, you know, weak on the floor and Mr. Dark is hovering over him and he tries to hit Mr. Dark, but Mr. Dark, you know, grabs his fist and slowly crushes it. Oh yeah. And for like one quick second you see a little bone pop up. Oh originally, yeah. Originally from what I researched, that shot was a whole lot longer. He saw like blood rushing down his hand and everything it was a lot gorier. Really? But yeah, but what happened was they showed it at the preview test screening for executives and they demanded that whole bit to be cut out. But the director in Bradbury, I, I think it was just the director, someone, said, um, we can't have that happen because in the second half of the movie he has a bandage around his, around his hand, so, uh, we don't know how to cover that one up. And mind you, this was after Disney did Dragon Slayer and they were extremely embarrassed mm -hmm. by it. They had, they had, like, priests getting mm -hmm. toasted, they had princesses getting eaten and stuff like that. So, it was at this point they realized, okay, we don't want to go in this dark direction, we want to change the pace of things, and Black Cauldron happened, enough said. And for me, this movie is an achievement in story and effects. In terms of story, it's 
really interesting how it compares to the novel. I read it last summer. It was supposed to be for a co-review, but scheduling difficulties got in the way. Long story short, um, we'll get to that later on. Um, but I found it interesting how the book by Ray Bradbury was vastly different than the film. It's more like reading poetry. The way that Bradbury describes these settings and these characters in this very visual aspect is almost like poetry. The fact he compares, like, autumn winds in a very alluring way, and you can almost picture and feel those autumn winds. He has a very unique writing style, I will say. Um, he is truly one of the best American authors I have ever read, just how he can take the visual description of, like, a carnival ride and make it very poetic-y and very atmospheric-like. It's just so so interesting to me, and it, it's funny because there's elements in the novel they knew they couldn't adapt to the big screen. The stuff is still there, but I think the stuff they changed to the film was kind of for the best. Um, if I can dig some of this up, a good example is the Dust Witch, who is seen as this very uh, supernatural-esque kind of figure, and it was difficult trying to nail a form in the movie because in the book, there was really not that big of a form, it was more ambiguous, so it's like, okay, we gotta show this form of this character that we have no idea what to do, and in the original version, they had all these different tests, uh, tests of what it could look like, and, well, this was one of them. Ooh. Yes, they dubbed that one the Walnut. Walnut? The Walnut. So, thanks to, um, digital technology, that became this. Mm. Yeah, that is legit freaky. And it's funny because the film alludes to a lot of stuff. We don't see, like, true forms or anything. It's all in the imagination, which is perfect. Um, the fact that anything supernatural is this green ectoplasm, the fact that the weather is like the hand of God coming down at the end and just sweeping everything away, which I think is a beautiful allegory. But again, there's elements that is in the book which are interesting, but I think they would have had a harder time adapting to the film, like the dust switch having this huge balloon, and this going to sound embarrassing when I say this, giant snails marking houses, if I remember correctly. It was really weird. Like, there's a scene where they hear all these weird noises, and they go out, and the kids go outside, and they see their homes are, like, covered in these giant trails of mucus or something like that. It, 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 I, it, it's in the book, I swear to God. I, if I remember correctly, they're like giant snails or something covering the house. It's really weird. And there was a bit where I think it was either Jim or uh, the other kid, Nightshade, who manages to destroy the witch somehow, but only temporarily, by shooting down the hot air balloon um, with an arrow. But yet, even that is much different. Where later on, the dad figures out it's laughter that kills her, and also joy and pride, which we see in a very intense scene where he goes back to the carnival and does this bullet trick, and kills the witch off with a wax bullet, which is bizarre. It's that weird thing back then where they have a bullet, where they have a gun at the person, the person try to catch the bullet with his teeth. Mm -hmm. Only back then it was a fake bullet, be like a wax bullet or something. But I think here he uses a real one and shoots her down, the audience is in peril, and Professor Stark like, um, it's all part of the act, she was meant to go down, okay, and boom. Um, <laughs> I'm actually glad they cut that out, because th what they do in the final movie, and I'm not gonna give too much away, I think really amps it up. You have the kids getting kidnapped, you have the kids getting captured, you have the father going in to save them, and he goes in that maze, and he sees, like, everyone, all the townspeople capturing everything, and this little section for him, which is his own personal fear, his own regret, the fact that he couldn't save his own son, the fact that his son was in peril, he couldn't do anything because he feared his age, and someone else had to dive in and save him, my god, that is really heavy baggage right there. The fact that he didn't live up to the responsibilities of the father as being a father, or being a father figure, that one moment he had where he could have been a true hero, and he let his own fear get the best of him, that is really heavy character development there. That is... 
I, I'm not even kidding, I cry every time I see that because that is just so difficult. Imagine if that was you, you had a family member that was in trouble, in, in so much peril, and you knew that despite the stakes, there was nothing you could do. There's nothing you could do to even go after them or do anything. That is such a hard moment, and to see that transcend in a sequence like that is so beautifully executed, and I just love elements like that. I, I really do, and I've never felt such a hit like that in a long time in a film. Um, uh, other changes, other changes, I'm trying to go through this quickly off the top of my head. The bit with the teacher was a whole lot more eerie in the novel. I'm going to admit mm -hmm. right now, I'm going to admit right now, the bit with the teacher was a whole lot scarier in the novel. I'm going to admit right now. There was this bit where she went through the maze. You're going to admit right now? Yeah. I, I, I will say this. There, it, 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 it's scary in the movie, but I think it's scarier in the novel because she disappears for a while and then the kids find this little girl. She's like, help me, I'm lost. And it's hinted that, that it's actually the teacher gotten younger and she's a kid and she's frightened. But then again... Even that's kind of mixed with the whole thing about people turning into kids in the novel. So in a sense, I'm glad that kind of got removed. Okay. Um, in terms of the film, Ray Bradbury worked really close with the director on trying to get his vision off the ground. And as you can imagine, it's difficult to do that sort of thing. Because you run into all sorts of problems on what scenes work, what scenes don't work. And that's really one of the big problems with the film. The fact that they had so many ideas for so many sequences, um, ideas on how to transcend certain things, that it was really the hampering of the production that brought the production down a bit. And a good example is where in the... Uh, thank you for spoiling that. Sorry. Um, it's okay. It, it, it happens. Um, a good example is the scene where the Dust Witch is attacking them in their own home, and originally there was this whole sequence where they're entrapped by her, by this giant-looking hand, if you can see there. Yeah. Um, now there's two sides of the story. One says the director didn't like the giant hokey hand, and so I got a cut. Another was they kind of liked the sequence, but they wanted to amp up the scariness, and this was a year after production wrapped. And so they're trying to find ways to improve the movie, and after one little scene, they noticed that made Tess audiences jump, which was a little spider in a caravan. He thought, wait a minute, if that makes audiences jump, thing would be like if they saw hordes of spiders. So that got cut out, and they replaced it with one of the scary scenes of the film, where they're surrounded by all these tarantulas and yes. spiders oh and everything. My God. Which, don't worry, for all of you animal activists, they were not real spiders. They were animatronic. Some of them were real, and they had to be really specially trained, but most of the time, they were robotic, so I just want to lay that down right now. And the problem is that it's well-staged, it's well-acted, and then you notice the kids are a year older. Yeah. That's the one thing that, that kills me, is as soon as they... as soon as they open their mouth to scream... Ah! Oh. Ah! Oh. Like, like, I was, I, okay, I, I admit, I was confused when I saw that scene first time around, because, My balls dropped. Ah. You know, because, because I thought that was, because I was thought that was, you know, something Professor Dark did, but then when I read a production story, I was like, oh, it was because of a reshoot. Okay. And even then, they had other things, too, which I found very interesting, um, in those two articles that I just presented. Um, there were, like, whole other scenes they had, which got nixed and lost. Um, a good example is an opening sequence they had, which was actually, believe it or not, I know, Matt, you have this issue, was going to be done by computer animation. We saw, like, bits of the kernel getting resurrected by the train set and spider webs and everything, and it would have been the first fully computer animated sequence, but it got cut pretty much for time reasons, and some of the stuff didn't work in. And so the closest that they saved was that one shot you saw this wide bit of the carnival panning out. And that's the closest of the computer materials that you get, aside from all the other little bits. Um, another lost scene, if I remember correctly, is originally at the end, instead of that whole temptation bit, you had the father walking through the mirror, and he sees older versions of himself stalking him, and they're actually going to be old people old seniors and stuff, but it didn't work. Um, 
some of that was saved. The scene where he looks himself in the mirror and he's slowly aging. That was in the original cut. That was saved for that one. But for all the production problems, which make it a little more interesting, in fact, I'm curious to see if some of this footage still survives. I consider that my Spider Pit sequence, to be honest. Um, just seeing all this Three original minutes. material and how it would have, you know, affected the film. But for what it is, I'm. This, this is one of those movies where I'm pleased with both versions, the novel and the film. It does as much respect as it could of the source while changing in spots where um, it's good. Even Ray Bradbury admits that it's it's a good adaptation, even if he was disappointed in some spots by it. So um, it's good to read around the Halloween season. It's one of my all-time favorite films overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, I gotta say that um, I, when I I remember back when I was working on the top ten scariest Disney moments, and I was just looking for things that it, like Disney has done that is considered scary. And oh my god, I gotta say something wicked this way comes was probably the one that blew me away the most. And um, I maybe I could be in the minority of this, but I find this to be so much better and so much scarier than Watcher in the Woods. Yes. yes. I said it. Yes. So do uh -oh. I. Oh. So do I. Oh, if you agree with that. Yeah, because we disagree. Oh, Watch from the Woods had more. Boy, we what? have what? controversy alert. Hey, hey, hey. Watch from the Woods had more production problems. And you couldn't even think of a good ending. Debate Watch it down below in the comments. Way, like, it, it has yeah. the creepy element, but it was just overall way too confusing. <laughs> that <laughs> somebody <laughs> wicked this way comes. What I love about it is that. Sorry, Morgan. I just had to continue. But, like. It's okay. The fact that it is a dis like I think the fact that it is a Disney film is what makes me like it more because like this is something that it, it tackles on something that at least I find that it's kind of that makes it ironic as a Disney film because like it kind of has this moral of be careful what you wish for because like you see the transformations of all the different people like uh, the teacher like she, like. The, like they take all the all the townspeople and they turn them into circus freaks, which is basically, basically um, kind of the theming of the autumn people, where you got the teacher, she's beautiful, but then she becomes blind, and then like you got, uh, I think the bar, like who was the bartender? It? The bar no, 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 the hairstyle. No, it's barber, the, the barber. Bar yeah, the barber. The barber. He's he's surrounded by women, but then suddenly he becomes a woman, a bearded lady. Um, uh, and then there's the racist one, where like the guy, um, the guy, like the cigar guy, ends up becoming uh, like he becomes really lucky, but then he becomes a uh, a Native American, because, <laughs> um, and also like and, and all this kinds of kind of stuff. But the suspense with especially the scenes with Mr. Dark, oh my God, they are he did, perfect. He works. And one of my favorite scenes is like in the library because the intensity is such an amazing it's like an amazing build-up and like this is like one of those situations where lightning strikes twice because first you got the scene where like he rips up the pages and every time he counts up it just like it builds up like he builds it up where like you see um the father like so much in pain and then right afterwards like you see he's going out and um like Mr. Dark trying to get the kids and like even that was suspenseful and like some may say that it was cliche but like even the moment like like you just see like the kids are hiding and then you see like his arms coming out to grab it and it's like oh! here's some two good books right here it was like it seriously was a freaky movie oh yeah that, they, that be <laughs> the bearded lady yes <laughs> okay, that uh, that scene, everything you talked about there, I will I will give this movie that much. That that whole entire climax oh, works oh, oh. because because oh. of Jonathan Price. What about because... when we see the Dust Witch for the first time in a casket of ice? That is freaky. Oh yes, yes, that is freaky. No, but I think the freakiest moment with the with the witch it was like it was this it, it was what you just showed. It was the scene like. She was. She kind of disguised herself as a bribe for uh, the the lightning rod guy, uh, like just to like kind of bribe him and stuff like that. 
uh, and then suddenly, like, she turns to the kids, and then, like, that face comes out, it's like, what the fridge? And then, like, also, immediately afterwards, Morgan, I'm surprised you didn't mention it, but that scene, like, we just see, like, this illusion of, like, one of the kids, like, yeah, like there's this guillotine, and then you see his head chopped off, it's like, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that, um, the head maybe... chopping... Maybe, maybe we yeah, there's like a total decapitation, like yeah. right in front of the kid's eyes. I was like, "What the fridge?" I I I actually forgot about that. How could you I forget know, that? I, I because of Jonathan Price. That's why. Yeah. Oh because yeah. Because it, I, mean, I will admit that is such an hour nowhere moment. But again, when we get our schedule set, hopefully we'll get around to finally reviewing this movie next Halloween. But I just want to bring up very briefly the scene where Dark disintegrates. That almost was not going to happen, as you saw it stage, because they thought the animatronic heads wouldn't work. Oh my god, that was so, an animatronic? I thought yeah. that was just makeup. So, so the special effects guys drag the director down, show them the different heads and everything, and show them how they work, and the director looked at him and they said, Okay, I believe you, it will work. Oh wow. So it was this close to not actually happening. Oh my god, oh, that, that was incredible. Because he thought the effects were going to be hokey right. and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, who do you want to hear about next? Matt or me? Well, how do I put this? It's a pretty hard decision to put in some aspects. I mean, there's so many options you can go into at this point. I could go with someone from Canada or someone from Texas. I can make an enemy. I can make an absolute friend. So you know what? I'm going to turn this over to Matt. He, he pretty much deserves it after the um, anticipation I've been putting him through for that cover review, which hopefully will happen soon. All right, so with me, I'm going to be very honest. I'm not much of a reader, to be very honest. Every time I talk about a movie or a film adaptation, like when, when it's based on a book, like I do get complaints from those people. Like I still get complaints to this day for my Legend of the Guardians, uh, like uh, Owls of Gahul. People keep telling me, you think it's a girl? <laughs> no, but anyways, um, I'm going to be pretty much talking about the only book that I have that I also own the movie which is fantastic mr fox and i got like um i just read the book like just recently and it's really interesting to talk about like the difference um first let me just start off with the book it, like in the book there's uh, actually two different sections the first half it talks it, it i'm actually really surprised that it really goes into bogus bunts and b pretty much they, they talk about who they are um like how like kind of like how they're pretty much like these disgusting people how they run these farms and stuff like that and like you only look a little bit at mr fox and then you go to the second half where it's pretty much mr fox's plan to go and get some food uh for like for his entire family and then later on he learns for everyone when badger comes in and tells them oh like we're hungry too because of what you have done and stuff like that and so it is simplistic, but it's also very whimsical in the style that only Roald Dahl can achieve. But then you got Fantastic Mr. Fox by Wes Anderson. And I'm, I'm going to be very honest. Like, when I first saw it, I thought it was a weird, weird movie. Thank like, you. I, uh, like, I was introduced because, like, I didn't know, like, what the heck am I watching? Because, like, the, st like, the style was kind of awkward in a sense. Especially in characters. They, 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 they look straight in the camera, they, they talk like they're really, really shy. You know, like, you know, just, uh, you know, having small conversations and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> no, but anyway, but then later on, um, the more I watch it, the more I really do love it. It really is awesome. In fact, uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox is now considered one of the greatest stop-motion animated features of all time, right next to um, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and it definitely is interesting. And the amount of changes, I'm actually surprised that they have done. Like, of course, there are the usual ones. Like, uh, uh, Wes really did put a lot of emphasis on characters, so they really, he really did put a lot of uh, persona and development on characters like Mr. Fox, Mrs. Fox, uh, Badger, and all those stuff. But he really did put a lot of focus more on uh, Mr. Fox than he did with Bogus Buns and Bean. Like, they, they are 
still prominent characters, but uh, they're not really like as featured as much like in the book. But mm-hmm. also, like he added, um, he also added elements like family issues. I think. Hold on, I'm trying to remember. What's the name of the son? I'm trying to recall. Um, oh, yeah, like, yeah, Ash. Fifteen minutes. Like in, in the book. Okay, in the book, uh, they were featured like he had. Oh, Mr. Fox had four sons, but in the movie, he only has one, and it's Ash. But then they bring in a new person, and like they bring in a new one, new guy, which is Christopherson, which is like his cousin. And, like, he had to come in because of, like, some problems and stuff like that. And, like, that's when they bring... Like, I guess that's kind of the weakest element of the movie is, like, they, they add in the story of the new guy and everybody's impressed with him instead of, uh, well, like, Ash and stuff like that. But other than that, it's, it really is impressive. It's, it really is beautiful to look at. And, um, uh, like, as for like how it is compared to like which is better and stuff like that i cannot really say because like honestly like the movie successfully captured the spirit and the heart of like what's the point of the book and the book is basically this wild goose chase for bogus bunts of being to go get mr fox and mr fox's mission to go and like make sure the whole tent like all the group of animals survive in the hole in the ground and trying to steal um, the farmer's food and stuff like that. So it really does capture the heart and spirit, but um, I don't think there's any comparison between them. Like, I think they're both great in their own merits because one, like, you got one that is adapted to a, one is a book written by one of the greatest children's authors, and then, like, you got, you got the movie, which is by a very prominent uh, auteur, or like film auteur, and it's very, just very fascinating. So overall, definitely is a, a wonderful adaptation. Uh, and yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, I think. I mean, I like. I I thought the film, I thought the film was was all right, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to mention something that you that you sort of topped on there. Uh, yeah, they do they do make the farmers look atrocious because let's face it if they didn't make the farmers look atrocious um we wouldn't be siding with them mm-hmm. but uh it, it it's always it's always stories like this where i i find myself fascinated by them and yet slightly conflicted at the same time because you kind of look at it and say well they're the, the good guys are going after our livestock and we uh you know, we kind of have to have food, and you know, it, it, there there's a, a certain segment of our society that that's built around farming. So, um, but um, I, as far as as far as the film is, I I thought it was. I I, I just sort of uh, thought it was okay for its time. It was one of the better. It was definitely one of the better Wes Anderson productions that that I had seen, and I have sort of a love hate relationship with Wes Anderson films. Mm. Uh, Morgan can testify to that. But um, sadly, yeah. Come on, Moonrise Kingdom is actually good. Um, I don't know if I've seen that one, but um, anyway, yeah, I think um. I, I think I've I've said it uh, all that I all that I can here except um, I have gotten a request to do this as a from pages to pictures and I do have a copy of the book in digital. Um, just when and where, I don't know. Um, I you know I like the the movie. I'd read the book beforehand and and I was, you know I'd seen almost all of Wes Anderson's movies. I mean I'm particularly fond of the Royal Tenenbaums. And and it did, you know, it was like basically an animated version of a Wes Anderson film, and I think he he captured the that Dalzian wit uh, pretty well. You know, one of my I guess one of my big problems I find is with the the, the choice of um, voice actors, like because he chose mostly American voices, which for me doesn't entirely fit with the English countryside. 
in the movie. It's just I just find it a weird juxtaposition of George Clooney and Meryl Streep in the, in the British countryside. I don't know. If That's me, actually it's, true. It, to me, it's like if for the um, Harry Potter movies, they had American kids but kept the Brit and, and British like actors playing the professors. It'd just be, you know, kind of weird. Um, so, but I think the movie is funny and and, and witty and and, I, and and really well animated. Press on oh, how much they kept it on set as much as possible. Because even like the recent Artman stuff, like the water and, and, and the pirates, you know, have CGL elements to them. But I, I'm impressed. Like when I saw your, your uh, look back on it, how how much they kept it on on set. And like he'd been working on it for for this adaptation for a number of years, and it came out pretty well, honestly. Yeah, it's actually yeah. very true. The only uh, CG, uh, the only element of CG that they ever used was the big, uh, was for the, the big like cider fight, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. pretty much it. Mm. I heard originally Henry Selick was going to do this adaptation, then he left to do um, Coraline. Yeah. I think it was. So yeah. it makes me wonder what his take would have been, though. Ironically, um, it's hard. Yeah, to because catch like, it. because he already did work with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah, because um, Henry Selig already worked with Wes Anderson for um, the uh, Life Aquatic of Steve Zissou, but then, like, well, duty calls with Coraline, so um, he just left An- uh, Wes Anderson, and it works. And but uh, the big advantage is that at least he had he went into a pretty good studio in Three Mills, which is pretty much the same studio that Tim Burton used for Corpse Bride and Frankie Weenie. And Henry Selig already adapted. Uh, Roald Dahl with James Giant Beach. I'm oh, yeah, sure if he had done a desk Mr. Fox, everybody would have thought it was a uh, Tim Burton movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I sometimes joke that that Henry Selleck, uh, Chris Noonan, and Jonathan Leesman are in a bar somewhere drinking together going, so your producer, so everyone thinks you're a producer directing the movie? Yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Jonathan Leedsman. Yes, oh, oh, that was good. Okay. That was a good one. God. Uh, yeah, but what? Stefan, I will say that um, it, it's it's actually very true what you said. Like, it's not just the main characters, but it's like all the animal characters are American, uh, like are American actors. Like, not just George Clooney, Mel Streep. Uh, like we got Jason Schwartzman, we got Bill Murray, we got Willem Dafoe, we got Owen Wilson, the most American wow. actors that you can ever. Well, in the case, well, the case of Wilson Schwartzman and uh, uh, Murray, I mean, they're always in West. Yeah, West that's West, that's a trope. So yeah. They were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are given. I mean, when you do think about it, it's like the British invaded America with rock, and now here are they are. The American animals are invading Britain, which is an interesting allegory. The Americanization of Actually, wait a minute. It, it kind of works in that weird subtext context when you do think about it. The Americanization of foreign times, because this is sort of like set in a very undisclosed 60s, 70s kind of era, because when you really do think about it throughout the ages, um, Britain has become a little more like America with pop culture um, and stuff along that consent. So maybe there's a reason behind the choosing of American actors, or maybe it's just coincidental. I don't know. But I think what works for me personally about the choosing of these characters are the performances. You have George Clooney, who works really well here, considering um, coming off of a brother or art thou, he really has that very, you know, master plan, mm-hmm. heist kind of angle. And he really works as kind of character who's fun, yet egotistical, and yet you don't hate the character because he has two aspects. He has friends to save and also his family at the same time. He knows he's the cause of all of this, and so he's trying to juggle two of the other, and there's a lot coming in. Um, what I really love about Wes Anderson is how he can take the most awkward of situations and really make you connect with it because you know you've been in these situations before, family, friends, 
all that kind of stuff. Um, a good example is Life Aquatic, where Steve Zizou is a complete jerk, because one, he lost his brother, two, all his fame and fortune gone to his head, and here he is taking his anguish out on this extinct animal <laughs> that he's going to hunt down and blow up. And I think what really works is how he can really make something so dry that is so awkward, but you're just laughing at it because it's like, wow, you can sort of see this happen in real life, but in sort of a, a weird kind of sense. And just the way he pulls it off, it has that very awkward, dry sting. But there's something charming about it that you just can't help, can't help but laugh at it. Hmm. Yeah, and as for... Uh... As for as for uh, as for other comparisons, I guess it would cut. Uh, Step and one thing you made me think of earlier was, I guess it would kind of make as much sense as having an uh, adaptation of King Arthur as a kid, where he's got an American accent but everybody else is British. Wait, that happened. It was the sword and the stone. Well, blast me to Bermuda. Mm -hmm. I uh, actually did see Fantastic Mr. Fox and not read the book, but god damn that movie. God damn that movie. I loved it so much. Oh, that's a good goddamn. It's okay. a good goddamn. I was like, I watched it the first time, it was just some rental, and I was like, okay, I gotta see what this is. And I was like, wow, the animation was good, voice acting was good, I loved George Clooney, personally. Um, god, it's so, like, just keep clicking in my head. Yeah, I, I just realized there is a, another character that I, I forgot, like they added in, that like a prominent character that they added for the movie that was not in the books. It's actually Kylie, the po uh, the possum, which is pretty much like his awkward, like Mr. Fox's awkward Really? Friend, which really does add in a new dimension into the story. Like, he, like it, it's <laughs> weird, like he's not in the book yet somehow, like, he does fit very well, like kind of like the butt, like the sidekick to Mr. Fox. Huh. Hmm. <laughs> Get a stone face there, Morgan. Okay, Morgan, 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 Morgan. Uh, like, if you need, if we need to know if you're okay, like, can you just give us a signal or something? Link. I'm sorry, what were we talking about again? <laughs> Just checking on you. Oh my god. How am I supposed to tell? Morgan, How am I supposed to tell? Morgan, you're gonna keep acting like that. You gotta give me a signal. Just, it looks like your, like your screen was frozen. It was weird. <laughs> you're still completely still. I was like, whoa. Um, oh my god. I get what he oh was doing. Oh my god. I've had practice. I was in one foot with the cuckoo's nest once in high school. Yeah. Yeah, I played a character named Ruckley, and his hands would be nailed to a wall instead of saying, well, I couldn't say the F word, so it had to be changed to screw them all. That's also based on the book, too. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember I did, like, a little short film of, uh, One Flew Over the, Coo One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I was, I was pretty much the main character. That was a crazy yes. thing. I think I still have a recording of that performance. I might have to dig that out. I have no point. time to talk about this. I got two minutes. <laughs> Fuck. Well, stop the clock. I will pause the clock so I can talk about my movie at least, because goddamn, I can't talk about this for less than two minutes. So I'm going to stop it right there. Play on. Tell that, tell that clock and you can take its time and shove it up its ugly ass. Speaking of clocks, <laughs> um, uh, so first off, it's nice, it's nice that you guys all went in a row on my side, so it's connect four. It was perfect. I was, did that experiment really good, so I'll probably do that in the future. I've never won a Connect Four before. Oh, I win. I good. It was perfect. My order was a little bit different than I was originally thinking. I figured I'd do a little fun little experiment with that. Anyways, uh, See, does anyone remember that commercial where they're doing Connect Four and they're like little sprite dots that are talking? Just just out there. That was a weird commercial. Uh, the sprites that were talking. I remember the animals talking. No, no, no. There, there's like a commercial where the kids are playing Connect Four, and you see like the little dots of like smiley faces and everything. It, it was like a sprite ad. It was, it was like no, it was like a Seven Up ad. I haven't it was seen weird. it. 
I don't know. I remember more the Guess Who commercial that ended with cards don't actually talk for you oh, stupid yeah. people out there. Yeah. I know. It's David. I win. <laughs> Your person has a beard. No. Farewell. Does he look like a bitch? <laughs> Just look like bitch. <laughs> Dahl, all right, Dahl has quoted my book as being a terrifying and marvelous book. And speaking of clocks, it's a clockwork orange. I was debating, I was mm. debating which book to talk about. I there was, I was debating between like Jackie Brown based on Rum Punch or Cujo, and I was like, okay, I went to the local library. I was like, okay, what movie, what book should I grab? And I grabbed a, a Clockwork Orange because I haven't seen the film. Figured I'd try something new, something different. And uh, it's a critically acclaimed film by uh, Kubrick. So I was like, okay, why not? Uh, plus it's way shorter than Cujo. <laughs> it's 192 pages. Um, uh, Clockwork Orange is a very unique book by Anthony Burgess. Um... Oh my god, it's very, it's like, it's set in the future, in Britain, and you got Alex, who speaks in this weird language, which is a mix of, um, Russian, um, and English rhyming slang, and it's just, I was reading it at first, I was like, what is this book, it's so British, it was unbelievable, I didn't know the terms, I was like, what am I reading, and so I was like, okay, this is not working. So I found an audiobook and I listened to it. And my god, it was so long. It was six hours and 30 minutes long. <laughs> I was like, okay. And it was really good because at first I was like, I kind of don't get it. But as I was listening to it more and more, I was like, this is really interesting. Like the story, it was very, very good. As I was getting used to the terms in there, the terms got, you know, I was getting so used to it. Um, so the thing was with Kubrick, he, uh, he was working on a Napoleon Bonaparte uh, pick. He wanted to write a so long. He's so fascinated with the character and with Napoleon. But he ended up scrapping it because when somebody gave him a copy of uh, a Clockwork Orange, the American Clockwork Orange, he was like, you know what? I'm going to make this into a movie. And the thing with this book and the film, it's very spot on, except for a couple of things. Um, it's very faithful, like, it's word for word the same as the book, uh, with some minus some scenes. Like, it's shorter in a sense, you know, they cut some scenes to make it shorter for the story. Um, the big, the big thing, the big thing that everybody's, uh, criticizing with Kubrick is that he adapted the American version, which was omitting a chapter, the last chapter of the book. Because the publisher at the time didn't want that chapter for some reason. I don't know why. And so everybody was like very concerning. I was like, wait, what happened? What That, that can't be the ending. What, what what happened at the end of the book? And uh, in 1986, they uh, reissued the book with a introduction by the author himself and explaining well, how about the, the, the novel being one of his least favorite novels and how people were like, mailing him all this letters like hey what happened at the end and uh, bah, 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 bah. and I was listening to it through the audiobook and I was like god damn this ending's really good why did it it's so damn good it's like a very like happy ending and I was like damn that would have been a great conclusion to the film and but I, I, I Kubrick oh my god Kubrick thought it was unrealistic the ending I was like I was reading that, I was like, Kubrick, you son of a bitch! That's the most realistic ending you can make into the movie. Like, because uh, Alex and his droogs, his friends, um, they're a gang, and they do some mischievous stuff all the time, you know? It's big old gang. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mischievous. <laughs> yeah, that, that's putting it like. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um... They went on shenanigans. Shenanigans, yeah, there you go. <laughs> shenanigans. Our car, our car broke down. Do you have a phone? Uh, Please, I'll bring the need your house. Oh, man, but uh, eventually they do this one crime, 
when one of them they're trying to break in and Alex gets framed well even though he was doing it uh, his friends just le left him alone it's like oh you traitors you betrayers and he gets caught and you go through this like sequence of you know he's going through the court system or the police station getting questioned and then he's getting going to the jail and eventually you lead up to the scene where he's being uh picked i believe to do this treatment where you watch these films he's got the iconic you know freaking thing and it's the most iconic thing in the damn fucking movie you know everybody parodies it everybody references it it's just it's just like no It's a sin. Yeah, and like the ironic thing is that it has nothing to do with the visuals. Like people use that gag mostly because of like what exactly, they see exactly. On but but like the actual like in the actual movie, it has nothing to do with what he sees. It's what he hears, which is like pretty much classical music, which is something he absolutely yes. Adores. But the catch is with the film, there wasn't a lot of classical music. That's one of the differences because. I believe in the film they only do it with uh, Beethoven Ninth, I believe, and that's it. Well, in the in the novel, he does it with all the music he listens to. So it's interesting he uh, reading the book and seeing uh, how he likes all like Mozart and Beethoven and just like you know he's, he comes from after prison and he hears Mozart from next door from a room and he's like, oh my god, I'm getting sick. Oh my god, shut it up! And he starts banging the walls, banging the walls, banging the walls, and it's just like, he goes crazy. And it's very intense. It's an intense book. And I was like, damn, that's a damn good book. Um, there's a lot of changes. Like, there's one point in the movie where the, he has a snake. He doesn't have a snake in the novel. The reason why they put a snake in there is because Malcolm McDowell was, had a fear of reptiles. And Kubrick's like, here you go, have a pet snake. <laughs> wow. Um, oh, you know that scene with Singing in the Rain? Completely improvised. Improvised. Yeah. improvised, not in the novel. Yeah, it was a, yeah, somehow that's a major, that's like a crucial element. It was the trigger for when he was at, like, in the house of, like, mm -hmm. that guy he beat up. Mm hmm. <laughs> it's it is just so funny to see the revelations like the second time he sang and then like like the guy's just there like oh my god it, for Fun years fact, after this Gene movie Kelly also did not approve who yeah Gene Kelly when he found out the yeah. song was used in, in the yeah movie, so he was not, I'm not so, surprised yeah, they, they were at a party at one point and uh, Malcolm Adele was like talking to Gene Kelly and all of a sudden he just scuffs off and walks away and that's because Gene Kelly didn't like his bed in the movie because <laughs> he thought there was like a distreatment of the song well well I mean like did Gene he, Kelly have to ask permission to use the song before I don't well, think I so well I mean like how, how would you ask permission for that hey Gene Kelly you mind if we use singing in rain so that we can use it for a scene when uh, our main character rapes a woman I mean I, I think well, I don't think Kelly no he didn't right, I, I think it's special. No. oh and no. also beat up a guy at the same right, time yeah. uh, it was very improvised because uh, uh, Kubrick didn't want this to be like some awkward, you know, rape scene, you know, he wanted something like with dancing and Dell was like, uh, started dancing and started singing in the rain. I was like, okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. And it was a like, keep that in the movie. It was just, that's not awkward it, at all. It was, it was just, um, um, the thing is, is this is about teenagers in the novel. He's a 15 year old in the novel. And I think in the film, he's like 17 or 18, which the, the evolution of the character didn't really mash up with the, uh, okay. I don't know. I, I felt like he sat, like I felt like he was like in his twenty-seven or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I felt. It's like it makes it kind of awkward seeing him like, like seeing Malcolm McDowell Dowell still living with his yeah mom. and his parents. Yeah, I was like, he's not fifteen. That's damn sure. Um, yeah, and they're they're talking about like him going to school and stuff. It's like yeah, uh, I thought that was awkward. Uh, but the, the last chapter in the book, if you get the revision book, um, it's glorious. It's, it wraps it up really tight. Um, he's 18 years old. And uh, I kind of have to re I, I have this book for the next four weeks from the library, so I have to reread it over and over to get understand it more. But basically, 
spoiler alert if you're not read the book, he has a son. He has a son, he's 18, and he has to find, he's on his next mission to, or his next step in life is to find a mate, a future mother, to take care of the baby with him. So, he's happy with life. And also, he meets, he bumps into um, Polly later on, and he's married with a wife. And, and what yeah, one of his, yep, one of his droogs, and it was like, that's touching, it's like they meet again, and it's just, I was crying at one point, I was like, oh my god, that's a great ending. No, fucked it up. Kubrick should have got the other version. Um, yeah. Oh, he was cute, um, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I will admit that I'm, I, I was pretty sad, I was happy with the ending that they did, like, it's kind of like the evil kind well, of Well, yeah, because he's a psychopath he, still, it's, so it's just not, there's no evolution yeah. of the character. He's, he hasn't changed. But the one, one, yeah, but the one thing I will say that I find so weird about uh, A Clockwork Orange is how after, like, he, he got cured and pretty much, like, he went out of his operation, it turned into such a freaking cartoon. Like, seriously, it's gone to the point, like, he, it's like, it's to show that he has major bad luck, but it's gone to the point where, like, he's having the worst day ever to the point that it's so freaking over the top, like, he got kicked out of his own mm -hmm. home, um, like, because of, like, a new father-in-law or a, something like in that. In the book, it was a roommate who took up his room to, to, to pay for the rent, so. Yeah. His name is Joe. And then, like, yeah, and then he got beaten up. By like he, he like he pretty much got destroyed by old people. Yep. And then like he meets, like then when he finds the police people, it was his old droogs that don't like him. And, and then like then he gets into the house, like he he was saved in a home where it's pretty much from the guy that he beat up and yeah. like uh, he raped his wife that he, who unfortunately died uh -huh. because of it. It's like, it's a ser it's like literally a series of unfortunate events that it just becomes like unreal to it's like it becomes so. It is because I like that's what I. It's called, it's it's called. I, I like that's what I like about it. It's just like it's, a like it's a roller coaster of emotions. Here. And it no, kind like of... there was at one point I feel like there should be a moment where Ooh. like, like one of these things happen and then like just. Why not just let out go? Wah, 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 oh, wah. oh, it's so intense it never stops. I, but I, I will admit like, that. Oops, sorry. I, sorry. I especially like the scene where he's in the hospital and he slowly realizes he doesn't have the illness anymore. We start throwing out insults. The, the timing on that is yeah. just great. How he's going. Yeah, he's with... Hey, would you come over here and make some eggs and steaky wakeys? Malcolm's really good in the role. I, I do give him credit for yeah. that. Um, I, I wanted visual. to say, sorry, what? I was about to say, visually and performance-wise, this is a very strong film. It makes me wonder just how it differs from the novel, but hearing it from Mike, it sounds like the dictionary in terms of execution. Um, but just the fact that you have this person who's pretty much, you know, still stuck doing this shift in this very Calvin and Hobbes kind of way, but to the extreme, like, you know, cranked up to 11, and how he's really stuck in those moments and forced to, like, you know, grow up and be mature in the world, it's sort of like that choice, whether you either consider and keep your own identity, or go with what society wants you to transform into, and what they see you as an upstanding role model, and I find that very, very interesting commentary. Um, it's better than Rocket's your decision where they win that sort of angle but here you see like two different sides of the equation it's 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 just really interesting to see Dowell the fact that he has power and then he goes without power and then at the end it's like oh look at the draw <laughs> I gotta be back on top again not only professional but also a little wiser and still immature as I was before um yeah, I thought the I thought the film's ending was kind of how should I say open for yeah, interpretation it is. and not having read the book. I I felt like I always feel like life is we we're, we're presented with with two extremes. There's an extreme good and an extreme bad. And Alex has conquered both uh, of these in 
in his the evolution of his character and it going all the way uh, going all the way uh, to where he was at he was at one side in the beginning obviously that was the wrong place for him to be no one's gonna you know no one's gonna argue that okay he was a he was a perfect child or anything mm -hmm. like that um, going near perfect and then having that having that illness uh, brought upon him psychologically um, this is uh, this is something that that happens this is you know just a, a case of a bad thing happening to a, a person who's trying to be good which he was at that point he was he was trying to be and I think at, at the end of the day we we all change as people and life is uh, is uh, is sort of about finding the medium between between the the good and the bad and for him uh for for Alex yeah you could you could say maybe he goes psycho again or or maybe he's just or maybe he's just free to think he he's just free to think as 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 some people think mm -hmm. uh, he's not a he's not going to be a perfect no, individual not at all um in the in the final chapter of the book actually he does actually have another team uh another three uh droogs he teams up with you know a couple, younger than him though he's like he's he's experienced older leader and he's got these three younger droogs and he's at the milk bar you know doing the thing and you know they look up to him and he's he's just chilling you know just he he he's feared his lot with his three two three four years you know and he's just he goes to his restaurant you know like i said he meets with polly and and then he just like yeah that's what happens uh kind of sounds like a throwback to the ending to george orwell's 1984 where the main character meets up with the quote-unquote love yeah. of his life and they realize all the stuff they went through that things can't work and they go this um i was reading that i was reading slash listening to the audiobook and I was like trying to imagine what it would look like on screen like it was because it's it's in a distant future it's like set in the future and I'm thinking what it's okay what is the angle here what what's the year what's the like what's the angle and I was watching Kubrick's version uh film and I was like oh, wow he's actually got some like retroisk uh futuristic looking stuff you know with the furniture and styles um kind of all that's missing is the reports. <laughs> I kind of, mm -hmm. I kind of, we're we're still yeah, waiting for those. They'll come eventually. I kind of wish I, I might be a little. I'm surprised they haven't remade it yet, I'm, or I ha I'm surprised they haven't. Which I I'm going to be a little controversial. Besides being the movie, because the movie is controversial. It's actually number two behind Passion of the Christ by Entertainment Weekly. Um, uh, Watch Mojo says it was a number one controversial movie, um, but I will say I really want this book to be like fully adapted in this full sequence, like in a different, you know, in a futuristic style, you know, but keeping with the retro kind of style. Because I liked it, because in the book there, he listens to music on these um, discs, they're play discs, he calls them, and I imagine like records, because they they he describes, you know, he puts the needle on it, it's like a record, and he, they goes to the record store, you know, that's where he gets his music, and and as I watched the film, I was like, okay, what's the play disc? Give me the play disc, and all of a sudden, he pops out with a tape. It's like a little micro table. It's an 1870s, mind you, so it's like a micro tape. He pops, and I was like, damn, that's a good idea. That's that's unique. I like that, because I'm a huge fan of tapes, so I was like, pop that in, listen to Beethoven. That was really good. Um, there's a lot of differences, like uh, in the novel, he doesn't have a last name, but they actually call him Delarge, like because in the novel he's also known as Alex Delarge. Be sure to tell him the large Alex sent you. <laughs> um, uh, what was it? Uh, and the prison number between the novel and the book is actually off by one number. Um, okay, so here's they go. It, there's there's a scene where they goes to the, the to the music store and he picks up these two chicks, 
Um, they're adults in the film, but uh, in the novel, they're two ten-year-olds. Yeah, he picks up two ten-year-old girls and, you know, one thing leads to another, gets them drunk, and fucks them. <laughs> so that's what it was yes it was uh, Kubrick decided uh, yeah he'd be a pedophile um, <laughs> um may heaven and bliss anyone <laughs> I, I, I was like whoa wait okay um, but there, you know that scene where they speed up all the footage yeah yeah that, that was actually really good but the reason why they did it is because they originally filmed 28 minutes worth of that. It's a, it was originally 28 minutes long. It would have made the film a lot longer. <laughs> so they're like, let's speed it up. And now, presenting Playboy After Midnight's Kubrick's Clockwork Orange, the adult in it. Extra tangerine juice. <laughs> uh, his original, like, cut, his uh, draft cut was four hours long. So... It was kind of interesting how they mm. would do that. Uh, da 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 da. Well, what else was it? Oh, the 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 policeman scene where the, one of his droogs beat the shit out of him. Um, in the novel, it was um, in the novel it was Dim and one of his old rivals, um, Billy, who were uh, doing that. Uh, there it wasn't Georgie because spoiler alert, he dies in the in the novel. Yeah, he gets... Doesn't he get AIDS or something? And they it turns out to... Uh, uh, the lady that he raped before also had... I, think, I believe so. so. So everybody got AIDS and shit? Everybody, everybody got, AIDS, got and shit. AIDS and shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not HIV, but full-blown AIDS. Everybody has AIDS. Hey, hey, hey. You know, I just thought of an interesting question, Mike. Um, you're talking about the idea of, you know, doing like um, a second adaptation uh -huh. Uh -huh. of the novel. What do you think it would be like if they did a modern eyes version, taking all those elements of the story and stuff, but sending it in today's Ooh. world? How do you think that would Ooh. work? Yeah, because there's always a little... That... Would, that, would that change the material? Would that diminish some of the stuff that could have said this dystopia uh, that's supposed to be a parody of social life and all that sort of stuff it's the up and downs of a of a, a young teenager you know the, the, that's what life is and um I guess the, the way Andrew Anthony uh, wrote it he was just thinking like uh it's in the future you know cause it's got certain laws you know there's it's very dystopian like cause it's you can't do that shit now. You can't, because you get arrested just like that. But you, you probably could try to make it a modern take. Like it could be like, uh, be yeah, because you can make it like, it's like it's a gang at first, and then he gets betrayed by his friends, and he gets locked up, and he goes through. And I, I kind of do imagine the modern take where instead of it's like a projector or like he gets all, you know, it's eyes open. He, you know, you get, like, modern movies, you know, films he looks at, you know, try to go crazy. I can, I can imagine that a little bit, you know. I, can, I think it work as a modern take, actually. It could. The story's, like, pretty much, like, stripped down of a up and down hill, like, um, Scarface, maybe, too. Like, rise and fall of somebody. I think oh, yeah, you'd, you'd, uh, the, what, Stephen, sorry? Go ahead. Yeah, I think part of the reason no one's tried doing new film adaptations because they've been like uh, a stage adaptation. Yes, there's no. plenty of those. Oh my god. <laughs> but I yeah. think part of the reason no one's tried to do a film adaptation is because ending aside, Kubrick was pretty faithful. He was, yeah, he was. He book. was word for word. It was yeah. like, what other interpretation could could you do? Because usually when they when they take a, a book that's made to move for it's it, it's usually cases when they want to make it closer to the book or um or if it's um uh for or it's a foreign film that they want to make into English for people who don't like subtitles uh, 
but I usually if the earlier film adaptation is pretty faithful and it, they kind of leave it alone and Clockwork Orange, you know, it's not like the the Shining where apparently Kubrick departed a lot from the source. So it made sense for them to then do another take. Same with Lolita. They also did a new adaptation of it. Did not know um, that. The Clock Orange is pretty faithful. It is. It, it, so I'm not it, sure what you could really it, add to it aside it, from the ending. It's uh, just the film. If I'm sorry, but if I may add like another reason to why nobody's really doing it is also the factor like um, I don't think any studio would want to face the major backlash at it because a lot because like nowadays a Clockwork Orange is considered uh, like a cinematic mm-hmm. masterpiece. And considering, like, the legacy of Stanley Kubrick is just, now he's, like, one of the, like, one of the, the mm-hmm. movie legends, yeah. pretty much. Like, one of the greatest film film directors of right. all time. So imagine if there's a studio who would have, like, the balls or, like, no, like way too naive to, to decide, yeah, we're going to do a remake of uh, A Clockwork Orange. Imagine the freaking controversy that's going to says- happen. <laughs> Yeah, I think like people are saying you're gonna ruin such a major yeah, I always like that. Assume, I always assume there's like an unwritten, like list of like movies that they they won't like readapt or redo because they know that like, Susan Kane is probably on there. E. T. Back to the Future movies. They're just so terror. It's like that's why you know, as much as I would love to see. A new, a new adaptation, a new like big budget adaptation of Wizard of Oz, that's like closer to the book and not a musical. The reaction mm. were someone to announce like I'm gonna do a new big budget adaptation of Wizard of Oz will be pretty immense. I think, you know, so that's why we mostly see prequels or sequels of right. that. Yeah. Yeah. Because with the original in everyone's minds. There's no way they can top it, and that's why something along the lines of Return of Oz exists, because they can look at different aspects of the source material and piece something into together, which brings to mind, I just realized, there is actually a movie that's almost in the vein of a modern version of Clockwork Orange, despite some major changes in the fact that it's not even influenced by Clockwork Orange, but obviously shares some similar elements. I'm just throwing it out there, um, Class of 1984. Oh yeah. That's when you enough. really, when you, when you really think about just how rebellious those that that those group of teens are, they're almost just like the Droogies from Clockwork Orange. The fact that they're raising hell in the school, they're rebelling without any rhyme or reason or any motive, and he, you're really sympathizing with these poor professors that are dealing with these teens that are just harassing them, torturing them. Uh, I believe there's one scene where they kill off Ronnie McDonald's animals, and he goes insane, and he's like holding him at gunpoint and stuff like that. Uh, again, there's ways of doing this. You can take these things as an influence and turn into something else, and that's where things succeed. That's why we don't see Catcher in the Rye. People hated the Catcher in the Rye. The offer said, no, you're not getting any film rights, so they said, okay, we'll just do films that sort of have an influence but not are really a direct adaptation or copy. There's ways of doing it, and I'm just curious to see if anyone out there is interested in doing that kind of thing. Well, fine. I wouldn't want to see an adaptation of Catcher in the Rye anyway. <laughs> <laughs> James, where do the ducks go in winter? <laughs> High five, James. I, <laughs> I, I couldn't even last the whole thing. I, I, I think I stopped by the stripper part and I said I'm done. So, this film has a lot of influence, especially pop, pop culture of references. I was looking through the list of them and I noticed that Heath Ledger, who played Joker in The Dark Knight, actually was inspired by the character of Alex from the film. Hmm. Just because of the wanton, uh, reckless, uh, an- anarchy of the character. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, there's a reference in Transpotting. Uh, there's a reference in the Coen Brothers Fargo when character says they're in town for the old in and out. <laughs> that was a good one. Ooh. Ooh, I, I, I feel so bad because I think it was the last year 
where they had the trios of horror, The Simpsons, and Lee's Spectacular, they did a pretty hilarious parody of Clockwork Orange, where Mo was like in the Malcolm McDowell role. Oh, I think it. I think I've and seen just, that one. And, and and then it ends with like a string of Stanley Cooper parodies from Eyes Wide Shut to Brian Linden, Full Metal Jacket at one point, 2001. I mean, my favorite bit is where Mo gets attacked by the, the bullies and they parody the scene with the the giant statue. He's like, no, no, not my schmo! <laughs> yes. I mean, Doc McDowell is pretty much in typecast. As as the villain, because most people just see him for that role. Um, yeah, he um, yeah. he plays I mean, it he, well the, though. The, the, one of the few no. exceptions I think was Time After Time, where he played H.G. Uh, H. Won- Wells. That was a good guy role he had. You, you, there, there was also Doctor Loomis in the first, mind you, the first Rob Zombie remake of Halloween. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It, he did a good job there. Yeah. yeah. Can't say so much for the second one, but there were problems. Is enough said. I just saw that one clip with where um, him and Weird Al are being interviewed yes. on a talk show. Yes. <laughs> the scene in the film. Yes. And he was even weird. Actually, Weird Al was the most normal thing about that movie. That's fascinating. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised that no one's remembering now. The fact that Malcolm McDowell played the big bad wolf on Chili Duvall's Fairy Tale Theater in the Lloyd Riding Hood episode. Hmm. I never saw it, so I wouldn't remember. It, it almost feels like as if he's channeling a little bit of the the character. It's really interesting yet weird just how he acts. Yeah, I, I think the only... I wanted to say this earlier, but, you know, mm-hmm. talking mm-hmm. heads are talking heads. Go ahead. Um, heads. Burn, mm-hmm. it down now. The, uh, the, the idea of, of taking, of, of taking a clockwork orange and putting it in a, in a contemporary setting, I would actually kind of argue maybe that could yeah, work. it could. I mean, you know, I mean, because, and, and this is why. Because the, the characters... And uh, and their motivations mm-hmm. and what's what's driving them and this setting is not it it's it's all actually kind of universal. Yeah. We have we have parts of our of our culture or cultures, as it were, where uh, where we got you know kids and and gangs going around. Sometimes getting mm-hmm. in trouble, sometimes different shit, and and it it's just it's a it's a class thing that uh, that that we're always gonna have to deal with. I think. Yeah. Uh, it it it's a uh, it's it's just now, attitudes. Now here's the yeah. here's the question. Uh, what did you guys think of the the the, the language that? The uh, Anthony used in the book, or slash Kubrick reused in the film, where it's all slang, rhyming, half Russian. Was that just like the, the, did that put you off, or did the, you do understand what was going on in the film? No, I, I thought the, it was no. clever. Oh. Yeah. I thought it, it, you know, made sense that they would have their own language and slang and. Because that's you know the the earlier generation have their own terms that they use. I mean nowadays they get more widespread, but there's always you know language that and, you know twisting of languages, you know kind of normal, right well, among young people. Ultra violence is not a a commonly used term. However, yeah. you. Don't need to. That's you that's don't... plain English right there. Is that there's no Russian or Slavic thing in with that. That's yeah. plain. Or I, I, or even him referring to other people as my yes, brother. Yes, lo- I'd love. I was gonna attempt to count every time he says, "Oh, my brother. Oh, my brothers." I I, I just love <laughs> like listening and reading it. Oh, my oh, brothers. My... Not to mention, 
Not to mention the amount of drug yes, milk. Yes, I love they that bar. Um, Wait, yes, that's milk? where they served at the milk bar. It's drugged milk. Well, well what else it, is it? Um, crap. Was it? It was in the novel. They, he does explain what it is, but I can't remember at the moment. It was a bunch of like specified drugs, and then it, it was like, um, but that place is is like so weird. It was just like I couldn't imagine with all the sculptures. There's a lot. There's a lot yeah, of like, nudity in this one. I was like. Phallic yeah. symbol, phallic symbol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw like the um, like the tables. It's like that seems inconvenient. I mean, <laughs> they look nice, but they're inconvenient. Put like a flat piece of glass or something. At the you uh, got filters on each end. <laughs> at the um, here there's a um, like a local kind of uh, you know movie theater and they have these rotating exhibitions like they had a Tim Burton one a couple of years ago and uh, a James Bond one a couple of years ago and recently they did a whole exhibition right it was like they have these collaborations with MoMA that they bring it to, to, the, oh, yeah. to the city and they had one recently for Kubrick that they went to and like each movie had its own room um, and you know, some of them were like recreations of props, some were like the actual props. Alright, so they actually had like the actual dresses of the twins from The Shining, for example. Wow. And the, um, and there's, so in the Clock of Orange room, they actually <laughs> had one of the, the statues from the milk bar. As you can imagine, kids were not allowed. Yes. In that, in that yes. Incident. I was just thinking about that. There was like there was like a sign, that, you know, before you enter, saying you know must be. Yes. Was... Old, right? Yeah, I was thinking like there must be like another pathway to like a shortcut to go around the Clockwork Orange one. Oh my god. And uh, they had the staff, like his staff as well. This oh yeah, crazy. yeah. There's a. God, I was I remember, I remember the reading the break in and then they do the break in in the film and. They got that phallic statue. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah, that like that dangling thing. It's like what? So it's, it's 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 you've heard of a you've heard of a butt's ass. Well, this is yes. the butt's penis. So it's 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 a dick, ooh, ooh, but it's got ooh, a ooh, butt ooh, ass. Ooh, sorry, sorry, I I, I got to do this. <clears throat> I've heard of a killer deep throating, but this is ridiculous. I was just I'm just. Uh... I was just looking at him. He's like, he's holding it like, just chasing her with it. I was like, what the fuck? And then, you know, the, all the cats in the room. I always wonder what animals are thinking when they're on a movie yes. set. Yeah, she. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, but like, I questioned that lady. It was like, what? It was like, who is this woman? Because there's not just that, well, that phallic statue and the cat. You see her the like, first time. She was. She, you she, see she, the artwork around her room. It's all like naked women and stuff like that. It's, it's like what it's is the whole film. It's like on? that. It's weird. Like they're setting up this universe where it's all phallic and yeah, sexed up. Um, in the book, yeah. she's a totally cat lady. She has all the cats and. They uh they didn't show in the film, but the, she has like milk dishes on the ground for the cats, and there was a point in the novel where Alex is going in and he trips over one and says, "Oops!" <laughs> <laughs> it would have been funny to see that, but Oopsie. he's like, "Oops!" and he falls over. And he's trying in the locks on the door. He's trying to figure out the locks on the door to get out. And it was it's a really good novel. I mean, if if you like the Kubrick film which is very faithful very faithful mind you except for the minor part of he didn't get the right edition of the book and got the american ending where edition where he did skip the ending but i digress if you want to actually read the real ending check out the uh reversion 1986 copy of a clockwork orange and if you want to see Malcolm McDowell in a villainous role who's also an anti-hero go watch the reluctant vampire episode of tales from the crypt i just remembered it okay or if that's not your game, watch Tank Girl. <laughs> Malcolm McDowell has been on a roller coaster ride. <laughs> they wasted a good chunk of money on a prosthetic kangaroo dong, and yet it didn't get used. What was up with that? They did? 
It was a deleted scene where the main character sleeps with one of the kangaroo creatures. Uh, and, it got, yeah. and it got and it got cut. That would... understandable. There, there's a couple. Yeah, I can see why. The Kubrick film I kind of know is uh, the scene where he does the suicide. Um, the way he did it was he put the cam a camera in a plastic box and just dropped it off the edge. It that does. Works. It was like really cool how they did that. Um, there was like. I liked how he, in the book, it's very, like, uh, a narrative where he talks about, he's telling a story. Like, I kind of like that aspect where it's a first person kind of thing where he tells a story. Which, he does it a little bit in the film, but then the whole book is like that. It's like one endless, like, storytelling by Alex. Like, he's telling, because he, every time he says, oh, my brothers, he's like, I'm imagining he's telling the story to, like, his uh, new set of druids or something. I thought it was really interesting in general. Maybe that, that is that, the case. That could be open interpretation. I mean, that's what I was always think about. Just pick up a copy. You probably like it. Um, Kubrick, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Five, four, three, two, one. French, what just happened? My ears! You're talking about My Hamlet ears. now? My ears! <laughs> My ears! Oh, Sorry. God, God, every time Sorry. I hear that. It's I like your ears are on top of your head, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, what, what are over here? It's up here. We have so many questions about oh. your anatomy now. <laughs> I get better radio reception. So yes, uh, this has been Cinema Royale. Next time, we're going to celebrate Matt's birthday for the whole freaking month. <laughs> Talking about <laughs> Disney. Oh. Disney, whether it's animation or live action. <laughs> Can we talk about horror Disney? Because it's, it's October. It's i got to do something wait, wait, for wait, Halloween. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say horror Disney? <laughs> Horror Disney. <laughs> Comment below if you heard horror or oh. horror. <laughs> but but that would make a great birthday present. Disney and babes. <laughs> oh, maybe Debbie will dress up for you. Okay. She's a whore. We'll do the Frozen special. <laughs> and a couple new readings. Um, but anyway. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, so... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed us. Comment below. Uh, what What's your favorite book to film annotation? What do you think about our choices? Uh, subscribe if you want to see more Cinema Royale. Uh, make sure you check out everybody here on that com. They get these guys are great. They make great content. It's it's worth it. <laughs> quick, quick plug. Uh, homeless Bobcat desperately wants a spinoff off the ground. If you think this is a good idea. Send your reasoning to projectorboothrequest at gmail.com and tell me Do it why. now! What are you doing? Do it now! And seeing we're four days late to the table, I just want to say, happy birthday, Jim Henson. Yay! Until next time. See you later, dudes. Later, Droogs. Ciao for now. Goodbye. Yeah. 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 Yeah.